notes about a minute early, but we're going to go ahead and start because we are so far apart. <laughs> uh, um, we left off Act 1, Scene 2, around line 75. So we're in that scene where Claudius, Gertrude, Polonius, Laertes, everybody's in this massive hall. And Hamlet's mother talks about um, Hamlet's looking for his father in the dust with his veiled lids and such, and finishes her little speech that says, Thou knowst his common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Uh, Hamlet, yeah, it, it's common. And also been by common there is ordinary. Yeah, that's the usual way of things. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems is a subjunctive <coughs> verb. It indicates a, condi a condition contrary to fact, okay? <clears throat> Which Hamlet picks up on. All she, mean, all she means by it is, why does it appear more than that to you, Hamlet? And she's kind of implying, there's more to your mourning, your sadness, than just your father's death. So he latches on that seems, and says, seems, madam? Nay, it is. And there's our appearance versus reality. It is more particular to Hamlet. Why? He doesn't address that yet. But why? She was discussing what? It is the nature of living things to die. Right? That's talking about the general. And then she asks, why is it so particular? Why does it seem so particular? That is, the death of everything living to you. Hamlet, seems? It doesn't seem, it is. How? It's not John's dad that died. It's not Ophelia's dad that, not yet. <laughs> it's not Rosencrantz's. It's his. Nay, it is, I know not seems. Tis not alone, my inky cloak, good mother. Little uh, sarcastic jive there. Nor customary suits of solid black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath. No, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected behavior of the visage. Together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief, customs of grief, that can denote me truly. And notice he says, denote, not truly. Connote. Denotation is the literal dictionary definition of a word. Connotations are the other associated meanings with that word. So what has he just said? He's described his appearance. Okay? Inky cloak, coat, if you want, nor the customary suits of solemn black, black shirt, black doublet, I should say, black hose, okay? Nor windy suspiration of forced breath, that is, sighing. Nor the fruitful river in the eye, tears. Both of those are common with someone who is mourning because to go to a funeral, especially if it's a tragic, horrific death and they haven't dealt with it yet, they're sitting there, you know, in shock. Nor the dejected behavior of the visage, this, the frowny face, you know. Together with, none of these things with all the forms, that is, all of the traditional ideas, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. Why? These indeed seem. These can be what? We're going to see very quickly. Starting, I believe, in Act 2, and then we see the play within the play in Act 3. Those can be acted. A good actor can do what? On cue. This is one of the things Bill Clinton was really good at. 
Say it again. Cry. Cry. You know, Bill Clinton would go out and there'd be some horrific thing, and he'd talk about feeling your pain. And he could, on, I mean, as if they're like, Mr. President, the camera's live, and the tear rolls, okay? These, he says, are actions that a man might play. And there's one of the themes of this play. Because acting is what? Appearing. It's that appearance versus reality thing again. They are the actions that a man might play, but I have that within which passes show. I have something within me that can't merely be played out. <coughs> These, the clothes, the tears, the looking down at the ground all the time, these are but the trappings and the suits of woe. These are mere outward <coughs> manifestations. All right? We're going to find out very soon. There's a reason why Hamlet only gives the outward manifestations of woe. Okay? We're going to see that at the beginning of... right up. So, the king hears that and says, "'Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet. Commendable in your nature. What does he mean, in your nature? It's got a variety of meanings, all kinds of connotations there. In your bodily form, in your flesh, in your nature as a son to a father, in your nature as a living son to a dead father, the real one, not the step one. I'm not saying stepfathers aren't real, but you get the idea. To give these morning duties to your father. Good job, Hamlet. If I had a son, that's what I'd want my son to do. Plotties is essentially saying. But, and every time you get a but, what do you know is coming? It's going to be an undercut, you know? I'm old-fashioned. A guy proposes to a woman, and she goes, I love you, but it's like, just cut it out right now. Just cut my heart out, stomp on it, okay? But you must know your father lost a father. Like, really? You're going to give me that kind of lesson now? That father lost, that is your grandfather, lost his father, your great-grandfather, and the survivor bound in filial obligation. Filial means sonly duty, okay? For some term to do obsequious sorrow, some term, an appropriate amount of time to do obsequious sorrow. Obsequious means praising, commemorating the dead. John Dunn, a contemporary of Shakespeare, wrote a series of, they're not literary series, he wrote a variety of poems that are called obsequies. They're commemorations of the death of these famous individuals. He was paid to do it, okay? But to persever, persevere we would say, <coughs> an obstinate condolment is a course of impious stubbornment. Uh, Stubbornness. So notice, obstinate condolement. We don't use the word condolement. We would say consolation or condolences, right? But this is obstinate sorrowing. How can you be obstinately sorrowful? Anybody know about anything about Queen Victoria? When Prince Albert died, she wore black, if I remember correctly, the rest of her life which was a long time. All of England, I think because of her, mourned, I think it was for a year. Okay, so flags, half mass, that kind of thing. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Obstinate condolement is not giving way to that sorrow. Holding on to it, grasping at it. Like if you let it go, you're going to forget that person. He says obstinate condolement is what? It is impious, what's the next word? Stubbornness. 
What does it mean to be impious? It's one, another pronunciation is impious. Well, pious related to piety, proper devotion towards God. So if it's impious, it's not proper devotion. It goes against God. And it's stubborn impiety. <coughs> like, you have to work at this. All right? He's not done there. What is he doing now? The obstinate condolement, he started to criticize Hamlet. This is a verbal spanking, so to speak. Tis unmanly grief. Okay, so you're a warrior, Hamlet's period. Hamlet would be considered a warrior because he's a prince. You're a warrior and you've been called unmanly. All right? He's essentially saying, Hamlet, quit acting like a girl. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven. What are we supposed to do? Not my will, but thine be done. I mean, you're supposed to align your will with God's. A heart unfortified, unfortified, without a castle, without battlements built around it. So what kind of heart is that? Weak. What's another word for a weak heart? Coward. <laughs> he doesn't have courage. He has the opposite. Cowardice. A mind impatient. What does impatient mean? Literally. Unwilling to wait. Or, a better way of putting it, unwilling to endure. Because bear in mind that word patient. It, it has multiple meanings. One of which is to suffer. Why? Because you don't go to a hospital when you're well. When you're a patient in a hospital, not just giving blood or tests or something like that, it's because you are unwell. You are suffering. So to be told to be patient means to endure in that suffering. So you have a mind impatient, unwilling to suffer, unwilling to endure. And understanding... Wisdom, learning, etc. Simple, that means foolish and unschooled, untrained. How long has Hamlet's father been dead? We don't know yet. We haven't been told. All we know is that the memory of his death is yet green. It's been relatively soon. Okay? And then he explains why Hamlet he has these things. For what we know must be, and is as common as any of the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? If you know it is the fate of humanity to die, why take the death of any one individual to heart? Well, if it's an individual on the other side of the world who really gives a rat, you know what, right? But I bet every person in this room, if we were to find out, today's Tuesday, Thursday, that, God forbid, one of you died between now and then, every one of us would, in one way or another, take that to heart. Whether you've spoken to that person or not. And we're not talking about these kinds of relationships. We're talking father to only son. Hmm. Fi. That's the Shakespearean term for the F word. <laughs> F it. Tis a fault to heaven. Fault? That means it's a sin. Hamlet, you are sinning against heaven. It is a fault against the dead. Let him go. <laughs> it's almost like by your continual mourning, you're not letting him requiescat in pactum, rest in peace. What else is it? See, fault to heaven, fault against the dead. It's a fault against nature. Why? Because the nature of things is to die. And it's a fault uh, to reason most absurd. Because reason should tell you this is going to happen. Whose common theme is death of fathers. And who still hath cried, that is reason has cried, from the beginning <laughs> till now. 
This must be so. Notice that from the first corpse till he that died today. Um, corpse is often spelled or also spelled Shakespeare's day C O R S E, just course. From the first course or first corpse to today. Well, what was the first corpse? Killed by his brother. Okay, we're going to see the ghost come in, and the ghost is going to say his death has the primal curse on it. Primal, the first. Hmm. So, Hamlet, he says, suck it up. <clears throat> Throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of me as dear old Dan. What is Claudius again to Hamlet? Now, <laughs> stepfather, uncle. Hmm. Think of us as a father, for let the world take note, that is, he's announcing this to everybody there, counselors, advisors, etc. You are the most immediate to our throne. Meaning? Heir. Hamlet, something happens to me, man. You become king. What's the problem with Claudius saying that? This is the Germanic kingdom. Germanic laws of inheritance rely on or are based on primogenitor. Okay? There's a, there is a slight twist to the Germanic system that you don't have, for example, in modern England or even Elizabethan England. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Primogenitor means eldest, well, this literally is child, but it's eldest son. My second eldest child is my eldest son, and he just loves to, around the other kids, they're all in their 20s, early 30s, he just loves, you know, I'm the heir, because he's the eldest son. And my daughter, eldest daughter, who's two years older, is like, airhead, maybe. You're not, you know. And that goes on. The difference in the Germanic system is there has to be an election. But the election is, like all the people in this room right now, say, yes, rubber stamp. You have a group of electors, and they formally it, that's where the idea of the electoral college came from. They formally elect the person who is quote unquote nominated. So you know, and th that's always the elder son, all right? Even in Anglo-Saxon England, this applied. Same kind of thing applied. So you're next in line. What's Hamlet probably thinking? My dad died. I was already next. I'm, I was already next of next in line, and you took my spot. Like you know, you're waiting for a parking spot, and a little Fiat 500 just sneaks in there. Don't go back to Wittenberg. Stay here. The Queen. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. Pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. King. Great reply. You know, I love that. And so he sends off ambassadors and such. Everybody leaves. <coughs> Walked off without my water today, so my throat's going to get really bad. And Hamlet gets his first soliloquy. And it's a doozy. Because we find out within a couple hundred lines of the beginning of the play, Hamlet's already thinking about something. Oh, that this two-two sullied flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve, would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Now, this is the version in the 1603 first printing of Hamlet, right? The version in the 
1623, first folio, reads solid. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Well, what's the difference between sullied and solid? One is moral, spiritual kind of implication, and the other is just referring to solids, right? So which one's right? See, in textual editing, one of the things, I used to be a textual editor, one of the things textual editors attempt to do is, it's kind of a balancing act to attempt to find what the author really intended as well as what is the best reading. Often, those two things are the same, but sometimes they're not. Why? Because sometimes authors' intentions shift over time. Or over time. Pick up a copy of James Joyce's Ulysses, and you'll never finish the damn thing. Why? Because Joyce was never happy with it. He just keeps revising the thing. And there are what are called genetic editions of that novel that show what the novel looked like first blush, when Joyce writes it, in the final version. And it's like this thick. And it's got italics and all the different kinds of fonts and things crossed out, etc. Okay? So there's a principle called Lectio Distinguishior Podior. This is reading more difficult, stronger. The more difficult reading is the stronger reading, or probably the best reading. So if you have two readings, and one of them's a little bit easier to understand in the context. That's probably not what the author intended. So look at that line again. Oh, that this too, too, <coughs> something, leave it blank for a moment, flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. What's being talked about in the latter half of the first line and all of the second line? Melt, thaw, and resolve. That sounds like something solid ice, turning into water, melting, thawing, resolving is purifying. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's pretty easy to see, right? But oh, that this too, too, sullied flesh. How does sullied flesh melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew? What's that process? And it's kind of given away with that word resolve. How do you get a clear spirit alcohol? What do you know? You get a bunch of mash or something, corn, grain, wheat, put it in a ton, big boiler essentially, put some water in it, crank up the heat. And what does it do? What happens when you boil water? You get steam, okay? What happens to that steam if you put a lid on it with tubing that comes out another end and empties into something else? That steam condenses in the tube and becomes <coughs> pure water. What does the process of boiling and condensation do? It takes out. It distills. It takes out all the impurities. So when you buy distilled water from a store, that means there's nothing, supposedly, nothing else in it. That's why some alcohol, it's, depending on its proof level, it gets pure and pure and pure and pure. And what's the one ever clear? It's like 180 proof. You drink that stuff and you have no intestinal lining anymore, essentially. Okay? That's what this is getting at. Yes? I mean, obviously, we're going with solid over solid because it, in, in the analysis it makes more sense and more interesting reading for the text. But like, there's also the simple like explanation that like clearly the sullied text like the, is older, so it's probably closer to the original like. Probably, probably. We have no idea if Shakespeare. Well, we we don't think Shakespeare was involved in this in the publication of this. Bear in mind, there are no plagiarism laws 
And Shakespeare said, you get your hands on a copy of a text, you can publish it as your own. This was under Shakespeare's name. Yes? You could also argue that solid is just redundant. The flesh is solid. That's exactly right. So take this and apply it to the flesh now. Melt, thaw, resolve itself into a dew. Notice, usually when you think of dew, dew like, you know, shows up on a piece of blade of grass in the morning, it's small, it's light, it's insubstantial. In no way is this small, light, or insubstantial. But this gets resolved into like a drop of pure something. Why? Because all the sullenness gets burnt, resolved away. What is that suggesting? The vast majority of himself is possessing. Himself and... Because this is Shakespeare's, really it's most religious play between Catholic ideas and Protestant ideas, okay? the vast majority of each of us, if we were to talk about it in a quantitative sense, is rot. It's foul. It's impure. And if we were to be purified, you know, it'd like we suddenly become mini, 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 you know, midgets, so to speak. Okay? So that's the first part. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would, thaw, would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or, so the first part means, now, kill me, God. Purify me now. Or, that the everlasting had not fixed its cannon against self-slaughter. What are those four lines telling us? What's Hamlet thinking about? Death clearly, his father's death, his own death. He would not say, why did you outlaw suicide? Self-slaughter. It's the English translation for suit, Latin, self-side, killing. Why would he ask that question if he wasn't thinking about suicide? And notice, it's his first soliloquy. He brings up the idea of suicide. Okay? Oh, God, God. How weary, still, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. And what does Hamlet do? He starts taking us, or maybe Shakespeare, into the mind of someone who is suicidal. I don't know if you've ever known anybody who is suicidal or severely, severely depressed. That describes them to a T. You wake up in the morning and you see nothing but pitch blackness. And it's not because it's 2 a.m. Sun shining outside, birds are singing. It's a quote unquote beautiful day to anybody else. But to you, there is nothing worth living for. Fire on it. Fun. F it. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Shakespeare loves the image of the world as a garden. He also loves the image of England as a garden. Okay? But it's a garden that is unweeded and grown to seed. That is, it's not been taken care of. That it should come to this. Oh, back up. Things, rank and gross in nature, possess it merely. Now, is he just talking generically there about things? See, if I were directing this, I would tell the actor playing Hamlet, point to where Claudius had been standing, or at least look at that spot, because that's the thing that possesses it merely. That is rank and gross in nature. That it should come to this. But two months dead. But means almost, not quite. Nay, not so much, not two. And what does he do? He compares his father with Claudius. 
His father, he says, was like Hyperion. The sun god in the Titan realm, period, of the gods. Apollo, or Phoebus, is the sun god in the Olympian period of the gods. The Olympians overthrow the Titans. Okay? So that's his father. And we get a description of what his father was like. And then we have, that was to this satyr. What's a satyr? Half man, half goat. I mean, it'd be one thing if he said, you know, Hyperion to a centaur. Because centaurs are cool. Half human, half horse. Goats, though. See, horses have positive connotations in the Middle Ages. Goats, they're known for one thing. Lecherous little buggers. Sleep with whatever they can get. And so are satyrs. Notice also, where would a, a satyr be on the great chain of being? Exactly. Bestiality? How, how do you get satyrs? Bestiality. Having sex with goats. Couldn't you also talk about people separate the sheep from the goats? Yeah, probably. It's interesting. He never makes any kind of, within the play, Shakespeare never does anything explicitly like that. Um, but, I mean, it's a possible reading. So, talks about how his father would, you know, not let the winds of heaven bother his mother, et cetera, et cetera. Line 143, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. That is, the more she ate from him, the hungrier she got, metaphorically eating. And yet, within a month, okay, so, but two months, nay, not two months, and yet within a month. So is it two months or is it under a month? Because yet within a month means less than an actual month. Later on, we're going to hear at one point, twice two months. So it's three to four weeks <laughs> to, two, to four months that his father's been dead. Now that later part could be because of the passage of time within the play, but it's not clear. Let me not think. Frailty, thy name is woman. Why? Because women are the weaker sex? Not here, at least. That's going to come up later in the ball, in the play. Frailty, thy name is woman. With a little month or air. Or air means or before. What? Those shoes that she followed her dead husband to burial were the same shoes she wore to her wedding, he implied. Marry with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of the of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her gallant eyes, she married. What does he mean by that? And it's metaphor, it's not literal. Before the tears even dried on her face, she married. Oh, most wicked speed. To post with such dexterity to a sister's sheets. What does that to post mean? But it's to post with such uh, dexterity. To post is to move to, to send, like the postal service. So she moved to, she sent herself, so to speak, with what? Such dexterity. In my um, textbook for my other class, Intro to Lit, it glosses dexterity. I don't know if your book does. Hopefully it doesn't. 157. Oh, good, it doesn't. Um, it glosses. It glosses dexterity, facility. We tend to only use that word facility to describe, like, this place, a building, a place, some place that you do so. What does it mean in the context that 
that editor is saying, ability. Everybody knows what dexterity means. She's like a gymnast. She gets in that bed so damn fast. And what is the bed? Incestuous sheets. Later on, Hamlet's going to talk about to his mother that those sheets are in semen. The gloss in my other book describes that as greasy or covered in grease. I don't know about you. I've slept in some pretty shady places, you know, motels, written by the minute, so to speak. <laughs> I've never been in one that has greasy sheets. Now, never brought a black light in to check for bodily fluids. Tend to leave those at home when I'm traveling. Um, but it's interesting when you get to that line, if you add one consonant to that word in semen, it really plays out the incest and the <coughs> actions going on in that bed. Okay, So he says, it is not nor it cannot come to good. Something's wrong, but break my heart. Why? For I must hold my tongue. Now bear in mind, we've talked about this before, what is a soliloquy doing? Or what is the character doing during a soliloquy? He's thinking. He or she is merely thinking. But we get to hear it. So it's thinking out loud. It's not meant for anybody else. It is talking to oneself. So what has he just told us? But break my heart. Why? I can't tell anybody this. What's the most important, in one sense, advice you can get to somebody who's, who's really troubled? Talk to someone. Talk to someone. Get it out. I have time for this? No, because we're like four days behind. Several years ago, this happened actually, uh, I related this the first time in, during National Suicide Month. Several years ago, when Jordan Peterson was, was becoming famous, he was doing one of his seminars somewhere, where he would ask people, you know, if you have questions, write them, send them up. Psychologist from Toronto, um, YouTube, all that kind of stuff, okay? Look them up. And people who paid extra would get to come up afterwards. Shake his hand, talk to him, get a book signed, that kind of thing. Well, one of the questions was, comments was, and I read a thing about it, and then I, it's not on YouTube. I read a thing about it, and the person described this happening. He gets the question, he starts to read it aloud and stops. And this is like an auditorium with 10,000 people in it. He just stops. Kind of chokes up a little bit. I'm thinking of committed suicide. Tell me why I shouldn't. And he just paused. And he said, I I'm thinking of committing suicide tomorrow, I think it was. Tell me why I shouldn't. Pearson paused, and, and the person describing it said, you can hear a pin drop in that place. What's the rush? What's the rush? Talk to somebody. The person came up afterwards, and they talked for a couple of minutes. Right, Peterson went on and said, talk to somebody. I mean, if you're going to commit suicide, then obviously that's final. Are, are there people you need to talk to beforehand? Are there family you need to notify? Do you have a friend, a pastor, a priest, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and what he emphasized was, you don't need to rush into this. There are people you can talk to. And he said, talk to me. At the end, the person came up, <clears throat> there were like 20 or 30 people, and he just said, it was me. And Peterson wrote down in tears. And the guy said, I'm not going to. Okay? 
Hamlet, he was at that point. Why? His heart was broken. He did not see. He was like Hamlet, you know, how weary, still, flat, and unprofitable is this world. And the guy later on was fine. Peterson talked to him then. He put him in contact with some people, etc. Hamlet is breaking at this point. And he doesn't what? He doesn't have anyone to talk to. Okay? Horatio comes in. They talk with Horatio. He talks with Horatio a bit. Horatio, he asks Horatio, why are you here? What are you doing here? He should be back in Wittenberg, where he's a student like Hamlet is. And he says, oh, you know, I'm a truant. Hamlet goes, tell me the truth. <laughs> I see right through you. He says, uh, I came to see your father's funeral. Don't mock me. I think you came to see my mother's wedding. It followed hard upon. Notice what that is implying. <clears throat> he can't, if we take Horatio's first words seriously, you know, it's not like I had to wait that long. But we're not meant to take Horatio's words seriously, his first words. He didn't necessarily come to see the funeral. But if he did, why would he do that? Why do people often go to funerals? Is it because they are intimately familiar with the person who has died? They're intimately, intimately familiar with the, those who have lived. And you go for what purpose? Respect. Respect and to comfort them, to bear some of that pain, to alleviate that, okay? That's what that guy that Peterson was talking to did not have. So, they go on and talk, and Hamlet says, methinks I see my father. And I think Horatio goes, where? Because <laughs> what did he see the night before? Goes to his father. He says, in my mind's eye, I saw him once. He was a goodly king. Yeah, he is a man. I think I saw him last night. Uh, who? Your father? The king, my father? Mm -hmm. Calm down. Season your admiration for a while. <laughs> it's like Hamlet's going to go crazy. Er. <laughs> and he tells him what he saw. Hamlet, where, when, don't tell anybody. He says, I'm going to keep watch with you tonight. <clears throat> all right? So they all leave, and Hamlet gets a little short four-line soliloquy. My father's spirit in arms, that is, loaded down with weaponry, all is not well. And that all probably means... All, everything is out of whack. The whole great chain of being is just boom. I doubt some foul play. Doubt their means expect. Oh, I wish night would come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Why does he tell his soul to sit still? Because when Horatio says, we're pretty sure we saw your dead father, when Hamlet said after a soliloquy, but break my heart, because I can't tell anybody, down boy, he's telling his soul, because his soul is roiling and bubbling like magma under a volcano. All it's waiting for is that opportunity to erupt. Okay? One three. We get a scene with Laertes and Ophelia, and then later on it's going to be Ophelia and... Um, Excuse me, it's going to be Laertes and Polonius. Okay, and then Polonius is going to talk to Ophelia. So, I'm going to skip a bit. What does, why the scene between Laertes and Ophelia? What's the importance of that? What does Laertes tell his sister about Hamlet? He doesn't have good intentions. He doesn't have good intentions. Okay, he goes like, so, what's up between you and Hamlet? 
And she's like, oh, you know, he kind of says he loves me. He's like, come on, man, stop. Why? Why does he say Hamlet doesn't love her? <clears throat> Let me put it this way. If a, there are four men in here, if a supermodel walked through the store right now, I'm married, so I'm, you know, out of the picture. Usually, some people would say, no, no, just whatever you want, you know. Which of the four of us, or would any of the four of us, have any shot? Most of us would probably go, mm, no. <laughs> Same thing. Hamlet is out of, I almost said Polonius's, different reading. <laughs> Hamlet is out of Ophelia's sphere. He is out of her reach. Why? Only one reason. He's the prince. She's what? She's a commoner. She's the daughter of the king's advisor. Woohoo! <laughs> okay? Because princes do what? Who do princes marry? Princesses. Princesses. Okay? Before Charles married Diana, what did the crown have to do? They had to figure out. Did Diana have royal blood? She did because she's a member of the Spencer line. That's why she was Lady Di, okay? What about William and Kate? Nope, they changed it. Why? Because it worked out so well between Charles and Diana. <clears throat> Elizabeth bent the rules, so to speak, for her grandson, all right? Just as they bent the rules later so that, you know, Charlotte can become monarch if George dies before her. You know, she's back there conniving. I'm gonna get it all. So, she goes, okay, okay. So he says, don't give up your honor to Hamlet. Don't have sex with Hamlet, is what that means. If you watch the Kenneth Branagh film, they're like bunnies, man. They're having sex wherever they can. It's not in the play, right? So Ophelia says, I will do my best to follow your advice, dear brother. And then she does what? She turns that table on him. But don't you tell me the thorny and rocky road to heaven and not follow that advice yourself. Don't. Give me the double standard, okay? So Polonius then says to Laertes, I've got some advice for you before you go back to school. Now, your introduction talked about this advice as being commonplace stuff and not very wise. My opinion could be entirely wrong. I think Bevington's full of a sack of you know what. Listen to this. So he says, these few precepts in thy memory, look thou character. Character means inscribe. Write these in your mind. This is going to be important because here's a father giving advice to a son. The very next scene is going to have a father giving advice to a son. And he's also going to tell him to do something to his mind. All right? Which is going to be a little bit different than what Polonius does. So here's what he wants him to remember. Give thy thoughts no tongue nor any unproportioned thought his act. What does that mean, modern English? Keep your thoughts to yourself. Okay? Don't think, <laughs> excuse me, don't speak without thinking. But it really means keep your thoughts to yourself and don't give any unproportioned thought his act. That means don't act without thinking through the consequences of that action. Good advice or bad advice? Good, Good advice. Why are you laughing? He's just not talking about it all. That's the problem. Polonius gives great advice. 
you know, go to the Gospels. Here's another example. Jesus tells his followers, do what the Pharisees say to do, but don't do what they do. Why? Because they don't follow the law of Moses. They almost do the opposite. So, be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. What in the world does that mean? Be known, but don't be too known. Don't be too much in the public eye. Where have we heard that before? Henry IV to his son. Because hell is what? Vulgar. Everybody knows what hell's up to. Okay? Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, that is, you've proven, proven their friendship, grapple them under thy soul with hoops of steel. What would Polonius think of social friends? He would think nothing of them. Why? How do you know that they're really your friends? Oh, because they liked you on whatever, okay? No. He says friends are people who will do what? Say it again? Tell you you're wrong? Stick with you through the proverbial thick and thin? They will not be the proverbial fair weather friends. What else? But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched unfledged courage. That is, the person who says, ooh, I'm going to be your friend, etc. You meet them at a party and you're suddenly best buds. You no. Beware of interest to a quarrel. Good advice, right? Try not to get in a fight. But being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. It's a great column, opinion column, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal by a guy who's a professor of international studies and all this kind of stuff. I wrote a response to it and I said, you know, Professor Mead, you're the most clear headed thinker and writer on the editorial opinion pages. Because this whole column was about how we in the West have to confront terrorism. And his point was, it's coming here. We saw what happened in Israel on 10-7. We saw what happened in Moscow two days ago. Anybody who thinks that kind of thing can't happen here is living with their head stuck in the sand. And his whole point is, in, when you respond, when you deal with those kinds of actions, what obviously and necessarily is going to happen? People will die. And sometimes, sadly, tragically, regrettably, innocent people will die. But what happens if you don't respond at all? more innocent people will die, ultimately, right? So what's, what's Polonius' point there? If you get into an argument with somebody, first of all, try not to, back away. But if you do, do what? George W. Bush's old, which we didn't do, shock and awe. So verbally beat the living daylights out of them, or if it becomes physical, physically beat the living daylights out of them so that they won't do what again? They won't challenge you again. Good advice, bad advice. See, I think one of the reasons, I'm gonna make a huge assumption, really, really huge, like African bull elephant huge, okay? I think Bevington probably doesn't like some of this because he is a member of the as am I, elite intelligentsia ruling class, so to speak, because of the educational standing and all that kind of stuff. And what do people like that generally, this is where I completely fall away from them, tend to think? All problems can be what? Solved. How? Smoothly. Peacefully. Rationally. We can just sit around, sit down around a table. No. No. Sometimes, hate to say it, 
Violence is the only proper response. Sometimes it's an issue of kill or be killed, period. He's saying, don't be in the be killed part. What else? Give every man thy ear. Wouldn't you just love to have Monty Python do this? Yes. They would pull up the ear. Give every man thy ear, meaning? Listen to what they say. But few thy voice. Keep your opinions, thoughts, ideas to yourself. Again, what is Polonius's job? What is he paid to do? <laughs> to give his voice. <sighs> Take each man's censure. See, that's a little bit different than give every man your ear. Give every, it just means listen to everybody. Take every man's censure. <sighs> that's hard, right? How did you like it when you got your exams back? With few exceptions, I'll bet some of you thought, dirty rotten, that's so weird. Been there, done that, believe me. I was looking at a paper yesterday that I'd written in college, because I've got them all in my file cabinet still, okay? And I, I read the professor, and I thought, you moron, you're wrong. <laughs> still, I thought that. You probably were, <laughs> okay? Take each man's censure. Listen to the criticism made of you. But reserve thy judgment means what? There's a context. Oh, yeah, but you, that's what it means. But it also means, simply speaking, don't judge others. If this play is about it's about a whole host of things. One of those is rushing to judgment. Costly thy habit as I first can buy, that is, wear nice clothes that you can afford. But don't come to class looking like Elton John or Beyonce, you know. I once had a student, she was in, I think I mentioned this before, she was in fashion design, sophomore level course. And she comes in, I'm not kidding, wearing a bridal gown that she had designed. It was beautiful. And we're like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Getting married, you know, in class or whatever? And she's like, no, I've got to wear this to my fashion. She couldn't have it in a suit bag and stuff. Anyways. <clears throat> okay. Why? Why wear nice clothes? For the apparel oft proclaims the man. As much as we, me, want to rebel against that idea. I'm at heart just an old California boy, born and raised, wore jeans and t-shirt, and I still often do. I don't, haven't worn a t-shirt yet, yet this semester. I'm trying to change my ways, you know. But if I were to be hired in the, one of the business departments and go into BAS, dressing like this, the dean would tell me to go home and change. They've got a dress code, suit and tie. Or really nice shirt and sport coat. And I think except for on Fridays. Why? Because businesses have casual Fridays. In which case it's slacks and like a polo. Okay? I've got colleagues who come in wearing tank tops and shorts. And I've seen colleagues wear less than that before. Years ago. Okay? So, what else? Neither a borrower nor a lender be. It's like he's channeling 500 years before Dave Ramsey, you know. Don't borrow money, don't lend money. Why? Because if you lend money to a friend, what may happen? You don't get it back. And you lose the friend. <laughs> Unless it's a buck, you know. In which case, if you're so cheap that you demand the buck back, you know, maybe you need to do some rethinking. What about borrowing? Your, your book says, for borrowing dulleth hudge, hudge, hudge of husbandry, edge of husbandry. Is there a gloss there? Thrift. It does have that meaning. Husbandry refers specifically to something else, though. Husbandry is part of like a, the phrase animal husbandry. What, what's that referring to? Farming. 
breeding livestock. Husbandry refers to work. Thrift refers to trying to get the best value for something, making your dollar, you know, last longer. This above all, that is this last piece, this above everything else I've just told you, uh, Laertes, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Now, is that just some stupid little aphorism? Is that just some dwaddle, as Bevington kind of suggests? Why not? I agree. It's good advice. To thine own self be true means what? Be to almost everyone, there are some who don't, sociopaths don't, okay? Almost everyone has an internal moral compass. They might, you know, ours might differ slightly, but generally they're the same. It's not right to do what? To take something that doesn't belong to you. To tell someone an untruth. To take a parking spot that somebody, you know, I always bring that example up because about 10 years ago, an MTSU student stabbed another student for the parking spot. The student who did the stabbing is in prison. I mean, she didn't just poke her with a pencil. It was a knife in the gut. Caught, whole nine yards. Go for a freaking parking spot. Go home. <laughs> Don't go to class. Be like students in my other classes who show up 30, 45, 50 minutes late, you know. <laughs> so like, make them like, why the hell do you even show up? Anyways. Um, the student survived, the one who was stabbed. Didn't get the parking spot, but you know. <laughs> Anyways, to thine own self be true, and it must follow us the night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. If you do what you know is right in here, then what can you not do to anybody else? What you know is wrong. Because if you know it's wrong, you won't do it. Problem is, none of us do that, right? We try, or we might try, okay? So, Laertes leaves. We've got 23 minutes to try to get through Act 4. <laughs> um, that's where we're supposed to be today. Uh, Laertes leaves, or at least Act 3, and he speaks to Ophelia. What were you and Ophelia, you and Laertes talking about? Oh, you know, something considering the Lord Hamlet. And he's like, yeah, I've heard about you and Hamlet spending time together, that you have given private, he has given private time to you. So what's between you? Notice what he sounds like. Overbearing father, you know. Got two daughters. <clears throat> she says, um, he hath my lord of late made many tenders of his affection to him. Affection? You speak like a green girl. Green girl, young girl, inexperienced girl, in the spring of her lifetime. Do we know how old Ophelia is? No, and we never find out. Ophelia is often portrayed as being pretty young. Late teens, early 20s. We don't find out how old Hamlet is until Act 5. Okay? It's important because when you find out how old he is, you kind of go, really? I'm still a student. <laughs> don't go there. Anyways, do you believe his tenders as you fish, as you call them? She goes, I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Feminist critics hate. That's too strong. They don't care for Ophelia very much because she's like an airhead. Seemingly. I don't think she is. I think there's more to Ophelia than we see. But it's lines like this, like, I don't know, Dad. Tell me what I should think, you know? And so he says, I will teach you. Think yourself a baby that you have taken these tenders for true pay which are not sterling. Now, she said those tenders were of what? His affection, okay? How does he describe them? Tenders, offerings, gifts. He's given her letters, he's written poems to her, 
everything, okay? He says, you've taken these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. He's just equated them to monetary terms, like a 10 pound note, and really it's what? Tell me, uh, my Lord, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. Importuned, appealed, begged. Not like, on, not like um, Helena, okay? With honorable fashion. What does she mean by honorable fashion? He's not done anything, done anything in, untoward. He's not a cad. He hasn't tried to rape her, okay? <clears throat> He's done everything above board. In other words, he's followed Miss Manners' etiquette guide for wooing a young woman, so to speak. And he says, I fashion, you may call it. What does he mean by fashion? Because it's different than what she means. He means this. Clothing. You could put a shirt on, you could take a shirt off. The honorable fashion Bingo. These are but actions a man might play. Polonius is saying, Hamlet, Ophelia, is playing with you. She responds. She hears that and doesn't agree. He hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. What? Why almost? Why not all the holy vows of heaven? Because all the holy vows would mean he's done what? Down on her knees, will you marry me? Okay? Springs to catch woodcocks. You got a gloss. What is that? These holy vows of heaven, Polonius says, honey, open your eyes. These are traps. Traps for what? To catch things. What are the things he wants to catch? Or how does he want to, let me rephrase that, trap Ophelia? What is Polonius ultimately saying Hamlet wants from Ophelia? Same thing Laertes did. He wants to get in her bed. More specifically, he wants to get in her pants. That's what they're both implying. Okay? She's like, but everything he said and done has been, you know, holy like, okay? So what does he tell her as a result of this conversation? Don't you dare let Lord Hamlet in your room ever again. In fact, I don't want you talking to him. In fact, I want you to return everything he's given you. Okay? I shall obey. Hamlet, Horatio, and the others come in. And... They talk, and the ghost comes in. Hamlet, 39. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. He's being redundant. Why? Because ministers of grace are angels. And angels are ministers of grace. Defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin dam, bring with the airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents, your purposes, wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. In other words, come hell or high water, are you dead? <laughs> Answer me. The ghost doesn't say anything. Why thy, tell me why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their sermons. Why the sepulcher wherein we saw thee quietly and earned, have oaked his ponderous and verbal jaws to cast thee up again. We went through all the full, proper religious rites of burial, is what he's talking about, and you're supposed to be in the grave. You're not supposed to come out of that grave until when? Until everybody comes out of the grave, judgment day. What does this mean, thou dead corpse, that you revisit thus the glimpses of the moon and the ghost? Beckons to Hamlet. Horatio and the others don't go. Hamlet, I will. Okay. Horatio, what if it assumes some other horrible form which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? 
What if it makes you go crazy? His implication is, and it makes you throw yourself into the river, throw yourself off a cliff. A little foreshadowing there, by the way, about the deep. Hamlet, I'm going. <laughs> okay? And so he follows the ghost, 1-5. Hamlet says, I'm not going any farther. <laughs> Speak. My hour has almost come when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Sulfurous and tormenting flames. What does that immediately connote in the mind? Hell. hell. Can't be hell. For one simple reason. You go to hell, you stay in hell. You don't get out of hell. Can't be someplace else. That's the Catholic doctrine. That's the Protestant doctrine. Okay? Catholic Church developed the idea of purgatory in the late first millennium, beginning around 900 or so. Becomes a doctrine by 12 or 1300. So, Hamlet, alas, poor ghost. I'm sorry. He's a ghost. If you're a ghost, how can you suffer from fire? You don't have a body. How can fire hurt? Anyways, don't pity me, but lend your hearing to what I shall unfold. In other words, give every man your ear. <laughs> Hamlet, speak. I'm bound to hear. Why? I'm bound there may be metaphorical like I am tight I cannot move so art thou to revenge and there we get the introduction of the revenge tragedy topic when you what shall hear what I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fasted fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away line 12 yeah for to fast and for the day confined to fast in fire. Your gloss says to do penance by fasting. I still don't like that. For, for what simple reason? Ghosts don't eat. Ghosts don't eat. Well, that's the hunger ghost, which is a thing that can turn folks Well, you know, uh, Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean. <clears throat> Captain Barbosa, there's a scene where he drinks some booze. And we see the moonlight shine on him, and it just goes through him. And he's really upset. Why? He can't taste it. He gets an apple, takes a bite. No flavor. To fast in fires means to do. Fasting is, is, is part in the, but the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, of an ascetical discipline. discipline. <laughs> like training for an athletic event. The only thing is, you're training yourself spiritually for a bigger event, the process of death and dying, all right? He's fasting in fires, meaning he's going without, he's suffering, he's testing himself, and what are the fires doing? Melting, thawing, and resolving him into a dew. Because the Catholic idea of purgatory is that you go to purgatory to be purified. Read Dante's Divine Comedy, read the Purgatorio. When Dante goes to the Purgatorio and climbs the seven hills of Mount Purgatory, each time he ascends to a new level, the sin, the pee that is on his forehead, gets wiped off. So that when he ascends to the very top of Purgatory and is getting ready to enter into Paradise, when he enters into Paradise, the final pee is removed. That is, at that point, He's clean, fully. Here, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. There's a reason why he's in purgatory, and it's because of how he died. Okay? So, he says, if I were to tell you about these fires, you'd die. So, they keep talking. Hamlet, tell me what it is I must do, he says, so that I may sweep to my revenge. 
Ghost, I find the end. In other words, way to go, son. That's what I like to hear, you know. But no, 39, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. In that speech, he said, you've heard it said that I went to sleep in my garden in the orchard and a serpent stung me. It did. It was the one who now wears the crown. Look at Hamlet's response. Why does he say, oh, my prophetic soul? And that gut instinct, something's not right. And he goes on, the ghost, and the ghost tells us that his brother is incestuous. Okay. So Hamlet's used incestuous to describe the relationship between his mother and stepfather. The ghost now uses it pretty clear. This is considered incest. So he talks about you know, how his wife fell off, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to skip a bunch. <clears throat> and he tells Hamlet that he was, line 77, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made. Meaning, the poison was poured in my ear and he didn't have an opportunity to do what? To be unburdened of his sin. How do you be unburdened of sin? Confession. In the Catholic Church, confession involves talking with a priest. You know, you, all those TV shows, you got the priest goes in one little cubicle and the other person goes in another little cubicle and they talk to each other. That's so that there's anonymity, so that the priest doesn't recognize the person confessing, the penitent. Okay? And the priest at the end of that says a prayer and absolves the person. The person is then, at that moment, Free of sin. Have I talked about in the beginning of the semester, did I talk about Martin Luther and Calvinism? Okay. That's the thing that bothered Luther. Because Luther one day left confession, and before he got to the door of the church, he sent up here. He's like, damn, got to go back to confession. And then he started thinking, wait a second. I'm always having to go back to confession right after I say confession. There's got to be a problem with this system. That's one of the 95 theses, you know, the problem with confession. What about if you're Protestant? Baptism. Baptism, depending upon the branch of Protestantism, because some Protestants don't believe in baptism at all. There are some Protestant branches where there are no rituals whatsoever. Okay? At the very least, most Protestants would say, you got to at least confess to Jesus. You got to at least confess in your mind, in your prayers, something like that. Okay? But you're not wiped free of sin by that. All Protestants, eh, I take that back, most Protestants would say, you're only cleansed because of the blood of Jesus and that kind of thing. All right? So, he died unconfessed. He died on what's called shriven. He didn't get those prayers of absolution over him. So he says, I died fully in sin. That's why he goes to purgatory. All right? So he says, remember me. So he commands Hamlet, get revenge. But he tells them one other thing, two other things, actually. However you pursue this act, however you get this revenge, <coughs> taint not thy mind. So what does it mean to not taint something? This side of the board is relatively untainted. It's just white, uh, I know, relatively. This side, it's tainted. If I were to bring in a big five-gallon glass vat of white paint, that would be untainted in terms of it being pure white. If I then had an eyedropper with one drop of black paint and dropped that black paint in, for all intents and purposes, that would be tainted. It might be a minuscule amount, but it would no longer be 
pure white. So he's saying, Hamlet, however you go about this act of revenge, and notice he doesn't tell him how to do it. He doesn't say, get a musket and from a hundred yards away behind a tree, shoot the dirty SOB in the back. Nor does he say, gut him. Just kill him. But he says, however you do it, don't take your mind. <clears throat> so, wild guesses. What does that mean, don't take your mind? So don't kill somebody knowing that killing is wrong? Again, what kind of society is this? Is this a pagan Roman society? No, it's not. It's a Christian society. Is revenge within the general Christian tradition, where the Catholic, Protestant, or whatever, allowed? No, never. Someone smacks you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. They ask for a coat, give them two, you know. It's always be nice kind of a thing. Why? Vengeance is God's. So like, like don't go out seeking revenge, just do it for like justice kind of deal? I don't know. In terms of what he's saying. I think what he's saying is don't become so focused that this becomes the be all and end all of your existence. And the reason I think that is because of Hamlet's next speech. All you host of heaven, O earth, that is, and all the host of earth, let me see, what else can I think of? Shall I couple hell? Unite them all? Whole, whole my heart. In you, my sinews grow not instant old, and bear me stiffly up, that is, let me live until I can do the one thing I have to do, which is kill Claudius. Remember thee? I, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. What has Hamlet just told us, told us about his mind? He's already distracted. What does it mean to be distracted? Drawn away. It literally means to be drawn away. The tract is like a tractor. It pulls things. Dis away. Bad. His mind is already what? Bad. It lacks focus. How do we know? Oh, that this too, too sully flesh would melt, fog, resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Anyone contemplating suicide is automatically distracted. Why? Because the mind is not thinking rationally, properly. Why not? One of the basic principles of living things that have ambulation, that can move, is they attempt to do what when they get into danger? Move away from the danger. See, trees can't do that when fires are coming at them. They just have to sit there and go, damn. <laughs> and suffer it. We run away. Someone who is committing, contemplating suicide is doing what? They're moving towards the danger. Not like a firefighter or a cop or a soldier. That's what makes them heroes. They run to, for what purpose? To save others. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial and fond records, all songs of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copy there. And in thy commandment, all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Taint not thy mind, for Hamlet has become Single-minded devotion. I've got one thing on my mind. Kill Claudius. He's done the exact opposite of what the ghost told him to do. Okay? What did Polonius tell Laertes? Character these in your mind. Hamlet hasn't charactered, char charactered, taint not thy mind. So, the others come in, Hamlet talks to them, he gets them to swear, 
that they've never seen the ghost, that is, don't tell anybody, and he also gets them to swear never to reveal what? That. 179. How strange or odd so air I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think me to put an antic disposition on. If I act crazy later on, don't look at each other and go, <laughs> look at him, he's acting crazy. Boy, damn good job, too. Don't give that out. Why does that present a problem for us as readers of the play? How do we know when he's acting and when he isn't? If he's contemplating suicide, there's a little bit of craziness already involved. Catholic Church, I don't know if it still does, throughout the Middle Ages and up until at least the 20th century, considered suicide to be the sin against the Holy Spirit. That is, the unforgivable sin. Because what can you not do after committing suicide? You can't repent. You can't go, oops. <clears throat> Nor can you repent before it. Another problem Martin Luther had with the idea of indulgences. You could buy an indulgence for a sin you hadn't yet committed. Nope. Okay. So we get 2 1, and I know it's 9 26, so we'll stop there. So we'll pick up with Act 2 on <coughs> Thursday. Um, and we'll try to get a lot further. Isn't this play like four hours long? If you do the whole thing and you don't cut any words, it's a little bit over four hours. Um, <laughs> Kenneth Brownells is the only one I know of that, doesn't, that didn't cut anything. I saw it and I'm like, there's parts that I, I do, I, I, I disagree, I do like it, but watching it, I'm like, 